Okay, welcome to Vim 101. My name is Matt Lehman, and we're at Frederick Open Source. And this is the month of May in 2020. And we're going to go over the basics of the Vim text editor. I'm going to walk you through what I know about Vim. Not everything, because I've been using Vim for a long time, but it hopefully give you some insight, take something away, whether you're a total novice or you've been doing Vim for years and just looking for another tip to add to your toolbox. Before I get too deep into that, though, I want to start with an important question of why learn Vim in the first place? Um, you may be a user of Vim, uh, or you may not be a user of Vim, I should say, and may be very comfortable with an IDE like PyCharm or Eclipse if you're doing Java or something like that. Or maybe you're a big fan of VS Code, Sublime, one of these other text editors. And you may wonder, well, what's the point of this? Why would you even consider learning this in the first place? And my big answer for that is, is simply this. It's everywhere. So this is Frederick Open Source. We talk a lot about Linux. And the Linux world is um, full of access to Vim. It is the, the basically the editor that you'll get in just about any environment uh, that you might log into. Uh, any Linux, new Linux machine that you might have will have some incarnation of Vim or VI on it in uh, some form or another. And that, that may not be true for some of this newer container stuff that's ultra minimal, that doesn't have anything on it. Um, but your average Linux machine will have a, a, a text editor that's built into the terminal, and it will often be VI is the one that's uh, convenient. So I think it's important to, to know some basic level of Vim in order to be able to navigate around in a system, whether you're looking at source code files or you're reading configuration files if you're more of a system administrator. I think this tool is a, good, a really good thing to have. So the next question I think that we need to understand is, or, or need to consider, is why is Vim so hard to understand? And this could also be considered, why, how, do, I don't, how do I know how to quit out of Vim? Um, people get really s stumble a lot with Vim, and it has quite a reputation in the software industry, uh, in the computer industry, I guess, of being this mysterious thing that's really hard to figure out. In fact, I think if you go on to Stack Overflow, this exact question of, well, maybe not the exact wording, but this question of how do I quit out of Vim is very commonly viewed, um, gets hundreds of thousands of hits or something crazy every year because people stumble on this program and then don't know what to do about it. So I, I want to phrase this or think about this from a perspective of how do you edit code? When, when you're thinking about code and, and ask yourself this question, do you read code more or, and when I say code here, insert your, your favorite text file. So if you're doing configuration files because you're a system admin, um, think that. I, I'm, I'm going to use code because I'm a programmer and this is the way I think about the world. So that's my context. But when you think about code, um, do, you, do you read it more or are you literally typing at the keyboard more? For, for myself and, and hopefully for all of you, if you really think about that question for any length of time, you'll discover that actually I'm spending way more time reading this stuff than I am literally typing on, on the keyboard. And so I think that that is very much ingrained into the way that Vim is designed. So Vim is a what's considered a modal text editor. And I threw up this picture of Voltron because, I don't know, it, it resonated with me when I was putting the slides together. Uh, but this idea of... Vim has these different components, these different modes that you work in that combine together make this really powerful character. But they're all separate and distinct in their own, own way. And the, the modal editor is the defining characteristic of Vim that makes it very different from something like VS Code. And, and it's so different because if you're working in a more standard edit editor, when you type a character, it immediately will appear 
on your screen. And, and Vim is not like that. Vim, Vim takes this different approach that says, hey, wait a minute, most of the time you're not actually wanting to type on the screen. So what if we rethink this and give you a different way to think and a different command palette that you can interact with and put it right at your fingertips and give you the entire alphabet uh, for that command palette by giving you the entire query keyboard since you're not uh, editing all the time. And so the main mode with Vim is something called normal mode. And it's when you, when you start up Vim, you actually start in this mode. And I believe it says it somewhere in the user interface of Vim, which is ultra minimalistic. Um, you might have to hit a certain keystroke to make it appear, but there are indicators that you are in normal, normal mode. And normal mode might be called command mode, um, but actually that would interflect, interact, um, excuse me, that would uh, conflict with some other, other modes. And so the naming gets a little weird, um, but this mode is where uh, Vim is expecting you to give it some sort of command. It's not looking for text that you want to add to your code file or your configuration file. It is purely saying, instruct me on what to do. And I'm going to do a demo in a few minutes and we'll see this in action. So just know that this is the, this is like home base is, is normal mode of your editor. And then the other mode that you'll interact with most often is insert mode. It's the mode where you actually are adding characters to the, the text files that you're working in, your source code file, your configuration file, whatever. And there are a variety of ways to enter this mode and do your thing and get out of this mode. So that's a, that's a big difference between uh, the standard Vim editor and a lot of other, other editors is you're switching modes. And I think that's what causes a lot of confusion for people is they don't understand what mode they're in so they will be very puzzled. Um, when I, my first encountered Vim, it was actually um, the first thing that I encountered when I started working uh, as a professional software engineer was VI. And I was working on the, the GPS ground control software station at Lockheed Martin. And my mentor who started me, um, she showed me how to sign in to Solaris, which is what we were using at the time. And she said, here, the help documentation is right here. And I think she was trying to troll me because what she did was say, she said, use this command to get started VI and then put in the file name and go. And then she left. She didn't tell me anything after that. I was just supposed to sit there and, and figure out the documentation. So I think, um, I don't know if it was a, intentionally a practical joke, but but looking back, I, I'm, I'm hoping it was because um, I stumble, stumbled mightily while trying to figure out how do, how do I do this? And that's because I didn't have this bit of context of there's these different modes in Vim. And so as I started typing, um, and like I said, you start out in normal mode, the, the experience was very poor. Suddenly I would insert text and I didn't know like why, what was it causing me to insert text? And I was very confused. Um, so this, this concept of gr grasping these modes is really important. So there's a third mode that I've listed on, on the slide deck here that's um, the visual mode. And it's a way of selecting text as well. So the combination of normal mode, insert mode, visual mode, and there's a key, couple other minor mode roles that I'm not going to go over here, are really the big drivers for how you will use and interact with them. And having this framework in your head of knowing that you need to do these modes is uh, is important. So let's let's move to a demo and and see what this looks like in action. But I'll pause there. Um, so if anybody has any questions, um, I'm happy to take them at this moment since I, I just covered this big aspect of Vim. All right. I'll judge by your silence that there are no questions. I can't actually, I know we're using Jitsi and I can't see the raised hand thing. So if there are questions in the chat, Mark, if you, if you could share them at some point. Um, because I can't really see them while I'm presenting. So what we're looking at is a standard Mac terminal. And I'm in the shell right now. I've not started Vim yet. And I'm in a project. And I'm going to use this as the baseline that we can look at while we're doing things. This is a Python project. There's a bunch of files in here. The files are not important for this presentation, but I didn't want to put together a bunch of sample data um, that was not reflective of reality. I wanted to give you something that you could actually 
uh, hook onto. So we're going to start with Vim, and we're going to actually use it with a special mode here because I've got quite a bit of customization, and I want you to show see it in its default state. So in later versions of Vim, there's this dash dash clean flag, which will allow you to start up Vim without most of your configuration. I don't expect you to remember that. I'm just gi giving you that baseline so you know that when I start this up, it should be like the standard experience that you might encounter on a Vim on Mac. And something actually surprised me about this is that in in the like really classic Vim VI mode, everything starts off more like this, black and white. And I was surprised to see that syntax highlighting was actually turned on by default in this mode. Here we are in Vim. And this is uh, a very Spartan interface. I mean, you've got the text file, and you've got a single line on the bottom. And if you don't know much of what those lines statements even mean, then, wow, talk about uh, being, being completely confused about what's going on here. So we are in normal mode. And this mode is, is for all sorts of things, it's, but it, it is largely used for navigation or around in the file and inserting the commands to, to change modes and do other things. Uh, one of the big things about Vim is it's, it's very centered on using the, the home row as much as you can and taking advantage of finger placement and not using arrow keys. And, and it has a lot of differences there. And it all stems from this power of you're not inserting text all the time. So if you want to navigate by default, you have J, K, L, and semicolon as your ways to navigate uh, on, on the file. And so the, the letters are mapped to down, up, right, and left. Not semicolon, excuse me, H. I, I know Vim so well that I don't remember all the keys. I have to think hard about what the keys actually are doing because my fingers just remember this stuff. Um, so I'm taking that back. H, J, K, and L. Those are the your navigation keys. And that's your, your main mode of getting to the line you want to get to in, in normal mode. So we have this advantage of never having to leave the home row. So there's a big speed advantage there. And we can start to pair that with the other command capabilities that come along with normal mode. So if we need to, for instance, go up and down faster than a line at a time, you can start to use other keys like control F to go forward, forward by a screen or backward by a screen by hitting control B. Um, and there's a there's essentially every key on this keyboard has some kind of command that's associated with it. And frankly, that can be pretty overwhelming to, to new people. So when you start with Vim, if you're starting out for the first time, you remember the, the primary navigation of H, J, K, and L, and that will get you a pretty far away. And so the, the next thing you need to know is, OK, if the other mode is, is when I do actually want to edit something, how do I do so? And that's where insert mode comes into play. Now, I said every key has a, a command function, basically. So can anybody who doesn't know Vim um, guess at what the command key is to get into insert mode? A. A. Okay. I think I can't remember. What do I? I can't even remember right now. That that is okay. You're you're correct, Patrick. That is that is a way to get into insert mode. I, I guess I lied a little bit. There's not just one a single way to get into insert mode. Any other guesses? Well, I'm not guessing, but it's I. Yes, thank you. <laughs> um, so I is is the way to get into insert insert mode, and A, as Patrick mentioned as well, is also a way. So they I, you and a lot of these keys have been mapped to words that you would know, and it's a matter of learning what the what is the word that goes with the key. And so I, uh, in normal mode, stands for insert, and it means insert 
in front of the, the cursor position that you're on. So if I just start typing here, um, you can see the big change that shows that the, we're in insert mode shows up in the lower left corner where it now says insert. So I can type to my heart's content and really gum up my source code file here. And when you're finished with insert mode, you return to normal mode by pressing the escape key. And so that's how you navigate in and out of insert mode. So here's here's an example of the, the power of normal mode now. So I, I just put in this junk in this file and with a single character, in this case, you, I can undo all of that um, junk that I added. So by switching from this constant back and forth between normal mode and insert mode is really the power of how uh, Vim will take advantage of things. So we have navigation, we have insert mode. Um, so we have navigation with normal mode plus all of its commands, and we have insert mode. And then we also have uh, visual mode. And visual mode, if you could guess which character, I, I won't make you say it out loud, but it's V, right? And so there's actually different kinds of visual mode. Um, so I'm going to hit the V character, and you can see uh, that it's switched to visual in the bottom. And it didn't seem like it did much. But now I'm going to start um, using J and K to go up and down. And then I'm going to use H and L to go left and right. And you can see what I'm doing is essentially creating a highlighted block. And that doesn't seem very useful at first until you realize that because you're still, you're, you're in this mode that's kind of a, an in-between mode between insert mode and normal mode. So if you use some of the commands that are available through uh, normal mode, you can change this stuff. So if I have this, this line here and I do this um, of selecting it, and I switch my selection. I switch from using just regular V to I use capital V. And notice the difference in the bottom cor corner now says it's, it's in a visual line mode. So it's a kind of a subset mode that changes it to work from individual character positions to entire lines. And so now I've selected the set, set of lines that I want to use, and I can use a, a command to delete those lines. In this case, I use the, the D key to delete. So we have this ability to use these three things in conjunction to issue commands to Vim or insert text or um, issue commands on portions of, of the text. And that's, that's kind of the core of working with Vim and, and, and the basics that you would need to know to interact with the file. OK, so I think that's, a, that's at this stage, the, the simple view of Vim. Let's jump back to the presentation and look at a little bit more. So if you're totally new to Vim, and I know there was at least one on the, on the line who said they were, um, how do you get started? Because you can poke around with them, and you might stumble across the commands that are appropriate in normal mode, but that's not a great way to learn when this editor is, is very Spartan on purpose. Matt, we did have a question from the chat. Okay. And that question is, does you undo everything inserted during the last insert mode session? The answer is yes, I believe. Well, with, with caveats. So let's come back here. Um, if you are in insert mode, I type some text here, and I type some more text. There is a way to break that promise, and it is by using, I believe it's by using the arrow keys to go to a new place and then add more. Now if I break out of insert mode, each one of those movements and insertions becomes two separate things that you have to undo. Okay, so insert mode by default will say, you know, whatever I type here, I could put in more enters, I could just put in a ton of junk here. And if I get out of insert mode and hit undo, all of that will be undone. But if I put in a bunch of junk 
but then start navigating away with the arrow keys and put in more junk, then it's two separate changes. Hopefully that makes sense. It, it does, thank you. Can, can I build on the question again? Yeah, go ahead. Let's say your your muscle memory, you know, you exit insert mode, you've just completed, you know, a, I don't know, a dozen lines of code that, you know, you're very excited about that were, it took you a long time to come up with it. Your muscle memory, you know, comes out of insert mode and you accidentally just slam undo. Uh, is there a way to undo the undo to roll that yes. back? Yeah, it's, um, it's control R. So okay. you can, it's re redo. redo the, <laughs> nice. The, All right. Thank yeah. you. And it's not R because the standard R character is actually stands for replace. So if I want to replace a single character, I can say R and then I can put in the character name. And in this case, I put K and it replaces the character that's under it. So there is a, a bit of a namespace. There, like, there are some certain times where namespace conflicts come up and English you know, only has so many words to say certain things. So the author of Vim you know, you chose these separate mappings for things sometimes. Take some, take some learning. Thank you. Yeah, sure, no problem. So, the so getting back to this question of how how do I get to that learning? Um, the there's a there's a few ways, and I listed a couple on the slides, but I realized one that I left off that's probably most perhaps most important. Um, but the first way is with a, a special program called Vim Tutor, and I don't recall if it's involved, excuse me, installed by default on every installation, but a lot of installations of Vim will come with this program called Vim Tutor. So let me actually quit out of here and we'll call up Vim Tutor. And here it is. It's, um, it's meant to guide you through it. And you can see that they very importantly put the keyboard navigation right in front of your face before you have to go down. Uh, so I think it says it's designed to be like a, here it is, a 25 to 30 minute thing to complete. And by the time you get through the bottom of this thing, you'll have a basic understanding of what is going on here. So you can see the first thing is how to navigate. And the second thing is that most common question about Vim on the internet of how do you, how do you get out of this thing? So Vim Tutor is a really a good way to get going if you want to get the basics of what are all these key mappings um, so that you understand why is I insert and A, what does that stand for? It actually stands for append and D is delete and there, and there are some oddball ones in there as well. Um, but I'll, I'll, Vim Tutor will walk you through a, a bunch of those. The other way I would recommend getting going is maybe you are a VS Code user or a Sublime user or an Eclipse user, or you know, fill in your, your editor of choice here. Vim has such a long history and is so popular that many of these things have a plugin that you can switch to a Vim mode. Because if you get experience with Vim, what you'll, you might find is, hey, wait a minute, this normal mode thing is actually kind of cool. I can navigate really quickly using H, J, K, and L, and the other shortcuts to jump around screens and my fingers never have to leave the home row. That's really neat. Um, so my, my caution is, is that you know, these plugins try their best to emulate Vim, but it's hard to emulate the fullness of, of Vim. So we're going to talk about mastery of Vim in a minute. And um, this is probably where you will run into the limitations of plugins, uh, of, excuse me, other editors' plugins, um, because they might not be able to, to capture all of the nuance that Vim does with certain things. And the one that I left off the slide that I sh I'm, I'm sad that I did is there's actually a lot of built-in help uh, for Vim. So I started up Vim here in its standard configuration and there's this, this hint here as well of anytime you need to get help, you can start by doing colon help. And I guess I should pause and say colon, here's, here's another one of uh, Vim's modes that that is not, um, it's less of a, a logical shift mode, like between normal and insert, and very much a, a distinction between um, you're in the main um, editor experience and able to navigate versus this mode here when you started with colon is now all of your focus has to go to the bottom line. And this mode is called EX mode. 
I believe it stands for execute. And it's it's kind of a command palette, if you will. So if you've used VS Code, there actually is a, a literally something called the command palette. A lot of other editors will have this, um, but it, this is Vim's version of the command palette. And it gives you uh, a place where you can enter commands. A lot of these are tab completable. So I could um, kind of tab through what commands are available if, if I don't remember the exact command. Um, but the help command is one that brings up Vim's help. And it will show you how to learn more about Vim. And what's fascinating about Vim is Vim's help is that it's similar to like the manual pages on a Linux operating system. So if you ever are stuck and you want to know what a certain key does, you can probably jump straight to that key by typing help and then whatever that thing is. So let's say I wanted to know what the A key does. I think I should be able to do help A and it will take me to A, um, which will exp explain exactly the, the naming behind it and A versus capital A versus all of these things. So it jumped us to the insert mode commands section it says that lowercase a is for appending text. And this is a, a way that you can always explore what those keys do. So if you happen to hit that random key that did something weird and you don't know what it did, this is a good way to dive into that. And you know there are plenty of keys. It's like, wow, that's a really strange one. Um, and, and sometimes you find out that it, keys can be, that are they're meant to be paired with each other and used in conjunction. And um, there's, it's hard to discover unless you actually read a little bit of the help documentation. So those are good ways to get started on that. Are you able to use the help uh, syntax in, uh, you said it was execute mode with like commands like control R, like can you do colon help control R? Um, yes, and I'm blanking. So you don't do, well, yes and no. So you don't literally do control R. That doesn't do anything here, I think. Um, but I believe that the help has a um, convention for some of these characters, and I'm sort of blanking what it is right now. I think it's CTRL R. Oh, but lowercase, maybe that'll do it. Control R. Well, you have to learn what the convention is, um, and I apologize. It might be this CR. Thing. How about that? What if we run CR? There it is. Okay. So if you use this angle bracket C dash R, that is um, how you get to the information about it. So there are a little, a few little interesting. So the Vim help dates back a long time. It's got some quirks uh, or warts on it, or quirks. That's the word I was looking for. And it takes a bit of getting used to. But once you get it and read that first help section, it explains how to navigate through it, navigate back and forth, and dig into other topics, go back, go up, go down. It's like a program within a program. It's pretty interesting in that way. All right. Any other questions before I move on? So none in chat. Excellent. The other topic of this is is some of you were not first timers to, to Vim and you're looking for a bit more. So there's this question about how do we achieve mastery? Is there are, are there ways to get better at Vim? And you know, one obvious answer is go go read more of the help. Anytime you encounter a character you don't know, look it up and see if you can start use it to use it. But there are other aspects that are, are less discoverable about Vim, perhaps, um, but still useful nonetheless. So this first one that I've listed is mastering motions. Motions are a way, here, let me actually bring up a file. Um, I'm going to bring up that same file, but I'm going to take off clean because I do customize my environment a lot, and so it helps me. This is, this is more of my at-home environment experience. Motions are a way of doing additional action and uh, working in a, a, 
a more concise manner. So the visual mode by itself, what I've got here is it works, um, but sometimes it's not, it's not context aware or it's not granular enough or it's not quite the selection you want. So there are other ways to interact and, and change things in ways that you would desire. So there's concepts of paragraphs and sentences and different sort of different types of selection styles that you can use to interact with them. And if you Matt, can, could you explain your line numbers at some point along the way? Because that would be interesting for a lot of people, I would think. Yeah, absolutely, Mark. I'll, I'll, I'll get to that too as well. So um, as you're selecting things and, and working with text, and if you can grasp what Vim wants to call these concepts, it's very powerful. So let's say, for instance, that this block, these two lines of code, they're related and for whatever reason, I want to delete them or change them in some way. So there's this notion of a paragraph. Um, it's a contiguous body of text. And so if I say VAP, what I've done is, is a motion. I've said, use a visual mode and then by using V and then A, I've said A changes from append in that context to around, and then adding in the around what is what you're trying to complete the thought with and around a paragraph. So by saying VAP, I have selected all of the text around the paragraph from Vim's point of view. And so then I can delete that. So, or I could say, and it doesn't have to be a visual command either. So for instance, Vim has an ability to quickly indent or outdent lines of code. And that in normal mode is the angle bracket keys. So, so if I do that a couple times on each one, I can in, indent or dedent something as much as I want. But if I wanted to do it to the block, I can say, um, let's see, greater than, AP, and it will do it for the entire block. So with three keystrokes, I indent the, the whole thing the way I want to. So that's, that's an example of a motion, and it helps with manipulating chunks of text rapidly. So if I come up and do this, I can, in like three keystrokes, I have now done a lot of editing work that might have been really painful in an environment where you have to, you know, go in and tab, 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 or, or an environment where this would also work, but you'd have to find other ways to select it, like with a mouse to drag over all the lines and then tab over, which is very common in a lot of IDEs and that kind of thing. Because remember, Vim is all about getting your fingers off of the mouse and keeping them on the keyboard to, to as much as possible. That's, that's one kind of motion that you can do. And motions can be, be um, aware of characters. For example, if I want to um, change everything within these uh, parentheses, I can say C, I, and then one of the parentheses characters. So that's change inside the parentheses. And it deletes all the stuff that's in there, and it lets you have the power to just be ready to edit. Those are those are motions, and uh, they're they're very useful for taking for kind of stepping up your game from J K up and down, which is fine. It's a good good way to get started, but moving more powerfully and selecting text more powerfully. So that's one way to improve your mastery of them. Any questions about motions? Are the indents tabs or spaces? And if they're spaces, can you set how many? Um, that's that's totally configurable. And I can when I bring up my my configuration file, I can show you the settings that that is set with. So you can use tabs, you can use spaces, and you can go further and set it on different file types. So let's say you're editing Go code, and the Go community, for whatever reason, I think uses tabs, um, which is sort of blasphemous for a Python developer like myself. Um, but <laughs> uh, you, you can do that in that editor and you can set those file types to be one style and then 
Python files, you know, their convention is to use four spaces. Um, so even though I'm in insert mode right now, I set my tab, I set it, I press the tab key, and it looked like it tabbed over one keys worth, but because of my configuration, that was actually four spaces. So I don't know if you can see my cursor going over each one here. You can kind of get the best of both worlds of, of having the experience of tabs, um, but get the right character or characters that you want to replace with. Are the, uh, are the motions uh, part of the base uh, setup or are those custom configurations or combinations? For the most part, they're part of the base setup. I, I don't want to say that completely because I have a number of plugins and frankly, I forget what some of them do. <laughs> so it could be that some of my plugins are augmenting motion powers. And I, so, you know, just in full disclosure, I, I would try it out. Maybe you have Vim locally, but, and, and can give it a shot right now. Uh, I think most of them should work. Like, like I said a, a second ago, if you had some parentheses, you should be able to do CI and then open parentheses um, to, to change the inner contents of the stuff. Um, so yeah, experiment with it and let me know. Another, and, and so I guess this, this sort of binding, uh, this character boundary stuff is also important. So you could do this for strings. So I could change, say this for CI double quote, and that changes all the content of a string. So it's a good way to quickly replace things that often get replaced in code files, like, like strings and like stuff in parentheses and brackets and so on. Matt, you had an example a moment ago. I think it was VAP, uh, and it was your basically you were selecting, you're going into visual mode and then selecting around the entire paragraph. Yep. I'm trying to infer from context the P being paragraph. What are some other examples of those areas? Is there one for like Word or some other subregion? Yes. Yeah. Um, so I just said VAW. So that's VA view. Um, visual mode around a word. So I highlighted it, that gets all of super here. Um, or I could do, and then I could switch it to V I W. So that's everything just not including the boundaries around the word, but just the word itself. Uh, there's also a notion of a sentence. So V A S. Some of, some of the ones like I, I frankly, the, the ones I use the most is the P. Uh, as to be like chunk getting chunks of stuff, VAP and then or CAP to like delete a whole paragraph and get ready to change it or DAP. That that's very common, a very common one for me. And then um, the other one that I mentioned was like if I need to change inside of brackets. Like here I am in the middle of this dictionary um, key key naming in, in Python, and so if I wanted to change the key name, it would be CI double quote. Or if I wanted to um, change it, like maybe it was not a dictionary and it was actually a list or something, I could actually change um, all of the stuff that's in the square brackets by doing CI square bracket. Um, so th those are the ones that I use the most. There are others, like there's, there's sentence is the other one that I think gets used, but um, it's it depends on, it has like Python, excuse me, uh, Vim, makes determinations of what a sentence is based on what it knows. So like here I'm doing, this is a comment. And so I'm doing VIS and it highlights that line and treats that as a sentence. But when I'm up on this area in the Python code, if I do the same thing, VIS, it now kind of behaves, it seems like it's behaving more like a paragraph selection, but subtly it's not it, because, well, is that true? Let me do V. IP. Yeah, it's subtly it's not. And the, the difference, you may not have even noticed it, but was that the leading indent for the uh, up here by today was not selected when I did a VIS. So it, the, the S versus the P gets a little wonky. Um, and I, I don't use it a whole lot because of that. So those are the selections I use most though. All right, so we have mastery of, of motions. And the next thing that I think is super useful if you're with them is when you have commands that you find yourself using regularly, using um, custom 
custom commands. And there's a lot of ways to do custom commands, but the most, the easiest and most successful way to do it is with something called the leader key. The leader key is, is something that a lot of Vim users who are just casual Vim users will have probably no idea that it even exists because they never customize their environment. But uh, for those that use Vim on a very regular basis and have a customization that they can, can rely on, like on their local machine, the leader keys are, are leader commands are super useful. So a leader key is just a, it's a key that's in normal mode and is available to add custom behavior. And you can actually even change your leader key. So the biggest key on the keyboard by far is the spacebar, right? And when you're in a text editor, normally spacebar gets used a lot when you're editing text, but what about normal mode? Why why not use the spacebar for some purpose? Because you can. Um, so what I've done in my configuration is I have set my leader key to be a spacebar. And so a leader key is it's kind of like an introductory key saying, I'm about to insert a custom command, be ready for it. So with a couple of keystrokes, I can insert extra things with using my leader key followed by whatever mapping I have. For example, if I'm in a Python file here, if I wanted to imp to set a debugger right here, the way to do that in Python is by bringing in a, a certain import called PDB and doing a call on set trace. That's a super annoying if every time I want to do it, I have to do import PDB and then PDB dot set trace. That's really no fun. Um, it's a lot of work. So what I decided to do years ago was make a leader command. So if I hit spacebar D, I get PDB set trace in a single line because I, I spend a lot of time working on Python and this is just a convenient thing for me to have. So using leader commands are a really great way to customize your experience um, if you have that. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna shift over to my um, configuration file and in Vim, um, if you look in the bottom left corner, you can see the name of that file. It's called a Vim RC. And when Vim starts up, it will read from this RC file and apply whatever configuration stuff you have in here. So at the bottom of my Vim RC file is all of the, the extra commands that I have. So a few lines up here, you can see my um, where I've actually declared that I want to use the spacebar as my leader key. And then you can start to see the commands that, that I create. Um, so the way to read this is, uh, this is in the normal mode, basically, uh, use the leader key followed by A and execute this particular EX command. So RG stands for rip grep, which is a, a amazingly fast version of grep. And it's built right into Vim. So if I do spacebar A, you can notice now that I have the EX mode up in the bottom corner and it has RG with a leading space. And so now I can type whatever I want. And so I can say um, students, because I know this is this application is about homeschool and I hit enter and it runs my RG command, which is bringing in search right into Vim for me so that I can navigate through and find the file that I want and oh, it happens to be in the student models file. So I'm gonna hit enter here and open that file. Um, so I, the purpose of that was not to, to show off how cool rip grep is, although it is. Um, the purpose is to show what leader, how leader commands work in practice. So it's a very concise way with two, two keystrokes to, in, to execute the most common things that I want to do. And I, I've tried to document my particular commands along the way so you can get a sense of a flavor of, of some of the things that I'm doing. That's that's leader. And if you are planning to use Vim in earnest and you do have commands you want to use, I highly recommend um, figuring out leader and uh, making it work for you. Chat and questions is Matt. Yeah. Uh, one question is would Matt mind sharing his Vim config files with us, which you've done, I think, 
Uh, there might be more to, that you'd like to show. And another question is, is, hold on. Is rip grep built into all vim? Those are the two questions. Ah, okay. So the first question is, I would happily share this with you. Um, in fact, I'll do you one better. Let's go over here outside the presentation. And my, all of my, my dot files. So if you want to learn more about me than just um, my Vim configuration, they're all up on GitHub. And I do this as a backup mechanism. So every, every editor setting I have for the different tools that I use, whether that's Git, Vim, ZSH, whatever, they're all here. And so I've got Vim, and here's my VimRC. It's up on GitHub. And so I can I can share that with the group afterwards, but it's it's MB Layman is my GitHub handle, and the repository is called dot files. Um, and so everything that we're looking at in my Vim editor right now is also source controlled on GitHub. The second question was about rip grep specifically, right? Um, the answer is no. That is one of the plugins that I I'm going to talk about plugins in just a minute, and that is the one of the plugins that I've added to extend vim um, i will say though however that there is a if you want to use grep there is a grep tool um, that is built into um vim and i i think it's slightly you can configure it so that it's more use useful than its default configuration um, because here it's kind of just showing it's sort of taking over your screen and, and it is showing me every example of homeschool, but um, it's kind of a, uh, the, the output of that is not super friendly. But if you want to learn about it, help grep, I'm sure. Um, we'll teach you all about using grep within Vim. If you don't want to bring in an external searching tool. The reason I brought in Vip, uh, rip grep is because it is just blindingly fast. Um, it is faster than grep um, well, I don't remember the exact numbers, but there's a great post by the author of RipGrep. So if you search for something like RipGrep benchmarks or speed test, there's a, a very extensive post comparing RipGrep versus uh, the Silver Searcher versus ACK versus Grep versus all sorts of search, popular search tools. And um, it's a pretty amazing search tool. So we've got um, leader keys here. I think that's basics of the leader key. Um, I, I didn't mention it, but the default leader key is the backslash character. So if you don't want to take over your space bar, uh, you can still start working with leader, the leader key by using backslash. Um, I find that backslash is a little bit out of the way for me, though, and space bar is nice and convenient. So it's, it's something worth giving a shot if you want to try it. Any other questions about leader keys or that stuff? So the last item that I have for achieving mastery is using plugins. And this one is perhaps a little bit more contentious for the Vim community. Um, there's, there's sort of two big mindsets that you'll encounter within the Vim community. There are those that say, absolutely, use plugins. They're, they're going to make your life better because they're tailor-made for whatever you need. and they're the way to extend your editor to do what you needed to do for your context. There's another group of people that will say, no, don't bother with that. Stick with stock Vim so that you know how to use it everywhere and you don't need to grow dependent on plugins. And I, I clearly, as someone who has plugins and has shown off a plugin already, fall in the former camp over the latter. Although, I used to be in that latter group of people. For a long time, I did, did never use plugins with Vim. And uh, this harkened back to my days where I was in a job that put me in classified labs where I could not bring my plugins with me. And so for that world, and if you're operating in that kind of world where you can't take your configuration with you, then yeah, I would say get comfortable with stock Vim, understand the, the basic setup, understand what you can do without any configuration changes, 
and that will be very fruitful for you. Um, there are going to be likely some changes that you will put on pretty much any environment anyway, whether that's copying four line a four line vim RC file like I used to do. Um, but you know that is a good good mode. So I'm not going to knock people who take that stance. Um, I, I I appreciate those folks and I, I value their position and and I do think that vim is a robust enough editor that you can be amazingly productive with it without a single plugin. That being said, plugins are awesome. So let's talk about let's talk about plugins. One more chat question. Yeah, go ahead. What system privileges are needed to add plugins? None. So plugins. Well, I, I say that. You know, you could always be on some crazy uh, system where your administrator is like locking down the whole world. In that case, I'm sorry for you, but. Assuming you have access, right access to your home directory, then then my answer is none. Because Vim plugins live in a a, a Vim directory, and um, if I bring up a new uh, terminal and go to my home directory, um, and do a, a list on it, and grep for Vim, um, you can see the directory is actually called .vim. I've I've personally got mine symlinked to my dot files repository. That's the how the magic works under the covers. Um, but if you create a dot vim directory, modern versions of vim will know to read that. And let's let's go into it just because. Um, so now we're in dot vim, which is actually a repository, as I said, um, and it has my vimrc file, but it also has all of my plugins in this directory. So that's that's that part. Mark, was there a second question there? I, I might be blanking out on whatever it was, if there was one. No, there wasn't. That was the last one. For now. OK, cool. Just want to make sure I had in the back of my head that there was a second question, but you know, I'm glad to be wrong. OK, so let's return to this. I'm still in my vimrc file. And now instead of looking at the bottom where my leader keys are, we're now looking at the top. And this section is using a, a tool called Vimplug. In Vimplug, you can find it on GitHub. There's instructions on how to install it. And the syntax for adding plugins is like, like, like what you see here. So Vimplug works by declaring this, this block in a Vimrc file. And then there's a block at the end of it um, to end your plugin declarations. And then the command that gets in, inserted is the, the GitHub URLs that you, for all the plugins. So Vim plugins, conventionally in, in this system, all are Git repositories. Although I think you can, you can probably customize that to be other locations if there's a plugin on, say, Bitbucket or GitLab or something like that. Um, but you know, this, the way to read this is that there's a, if you went to github.com slash AMDV slash black, you would, should find a repository there. And um, the way to then use them is there are some commands that come from them plug. And I'm, I'm showing them in the bottom left right now. And plug install is how you actually install plugins. And so what this will do is it will clone all of those repositories. It will put them in that plugged directory within your Vim directory. And then when you run Vim, you either reload Vim or, or um, start start a new Vim process, those plugins will be enabled for you to use. And so this is where I get all of my extra superpowers that that uh, I find super useful. So I'll, I'll show off one or two of them so that you can get a flavor for it and you can decide if plugins are, are useful to you. Um, and then you're welcome to explore my list of plugins that I have here. I think some of these are great, um, but I obviously have a bias because this is my VimRC file. Um, and I, I before before talking about individual plugins, I guess I should also say uh, the latest version of Vim has a plugin system built in now. Um, maybe it's improved, but there are some limitations to it. So it will work if you put files in the right directory. But last time I checked, the big thing that it was missing is an ability to actually go fetch 
the plugins. So it kind of puts all of that onus on you as the Vim user to get the plugins in the right directory. And so what I like about plugin management tools, and, and Vim plug is only one of them. There's others, there's another one called Pathogen, and there's one or two other popular ones, um, is they take care of that, putting the plugins in the right spot for you, uh, which I think is a really good feature. Let's talk about a couple of cool Vim plugins, and then we'll we'll wrap it up. But any other final questions? Um, so here is the plugin set that I have, and most of those mean nothing to you. Um, so let's return to our Python file that we had as the example, and talk about a couple of them. the The one that I showed already was the search plugin, which uses rip grep. And that's really useful for jumping around and getting up uh, a list of, of items and navigating to new files. Um, it's very convenient and very powerful. Um, so that's one method of navigating between Vim. And I'll, I'll pause here to say that uh, Vim navigation is something that is not super easy to do out of the box, but with a couple of plugins, that you can basically make it so that you live in Vim. You don't have to navigate out. And this is useful because some plugins take advantage of knowing other files that you've opened, make navigation easier, and make it so you aren't shutting the process off and on repeatedly. And there's a lot of advantages to that. Hey, Matt. Um, yes. You kind of alluded to this earlier, and, and I just wanted to check in how do you, I mean, for those of us that have lived in the GUI world for so long, you know, the mouse is kind of, it's it becomes over over controlling. Do you avoid the mouse altogether? Is that part of the intention here to like keep your hand off the mouse? Then? Yes, in, in Vim, I do not touch the mouse. In fact, yeah. I think, let me see, I, I, I can. So I can select some stuff. Um, and so the okay, I take that back. There's there's probably a handful of times where if I have a single line of stuff and I'm about to copy something to the browser, I might copy that. But you can notice a, a problem immediately as I wrap lines. So I haven't talked about the line number thing yet. That's a good reminder. Um, but if I copied this right now and tried to paste this in somewhere, it's going to include the line number. So e even like that kind of selection is not does not work well for my environment. So instead, for example, if I was going to copy these two lines and then paste them into you know, a Google search because they were actually an error message of something that I couldn't figure out, I would select the lines and then copy them into a special place that is in the, the, the uh, essentially the clipboard of the operating system. So you can copy directly from Vim into your system clipboard. And then, um, so I've never, I didn't have to select anything with a mouse. It was all um, done within Vim. Nice. So yeah. I, I, I very much keep my fingers off the keyboard, off the mouse as much as possible. Yeah, it kind of feels like that's one of the limiting factors when you're learning Vim. And that's been my, you know, the mouse is such a go to thing yep. in every layer that you, you just, you know, after years of doing it, you just keep doing it. It's hard. Yeah. It is, you're, you're absolutely right, Mark. It, it's very, very hard to break. And the, the, the kind of the next level of that is, is the other thing that you'll find is the people who use Vim will, their initial reaction for a lot of navigation is to use the arrow keys. Like I'm using the arrow keys right now and they function just like H, J, K, and L. Um, but I, I never use these. In fact, it feels super weird to be navigating in Vim right now with arrow keys. It just feels wrong to me um, because I'm keeping my fingers on the home row. I don't have to go anywhere. I don't have that travel of motion of, of even that small change in motion in the wrist is time. So it, it might seem like a micro optimization and it probably is, but living on the home row um, be, starts to become very natural feeling and you feel super productive after a while if you can do it. So I was talking about plugins. I was talking about navigation and, and saying that you know it's beneficial to stay in Vim if you can. And why is that? Uh, a pattern that 
new folks in Vim might encounter, and I was like this for many years, is you're in the shell, you've got your file, you know, okay, I needed to look at a, a file that was in here, so I'm gonna go into homeschool, I'm gonna go into core, and what's in here again? Um, oh yeah, it's this file. I'm gonna come in here, I'm going to add those characters, and I'm gonna quit, and now I need to go somewhere else. Where do I need to go? It's up this area, you know, so you can see that this, this mode has a lot of overhead of navigating back and forth. And it especially gets exacerbated if say you're running test commands or something that are ex expected to run elsewhere. So if you can stay inside of Vim, then you can get a lot of power out of that. And one way that, to make that work is with a plugin called um, Control-P for fuzzy finding. And there are, there are a couple other fuzzy finding plugins out there, but they operate by giving you a command which I've mapped to a leader key. So here I did a leader key command. In my case, I did spacebar C. And if I wanna to go to that same file, that was in core views. And so I typed a few characters, C-O-R-V, and the fuzzy finder found it. And I hit enter, and it brings up that same exact file. And so I've navigated to the file without navigating through my, um, my file directory on my um, uh, shell, and I'm living within Vim. And so that, that's a, another super useful way to get around. So I use, to navigate through files, I use fu fuzzy file finding, like you saw. I use the ripgrep plugin to do file searching to jump around to files. And there is another one that I will sometimes use for um, when I'm having to do a more of an exploratory approach. There's a plugin, I think it's called Vim Vinegar, and it, uh, I just hit the minus key just now, and it brought up this directory view of all of the files of where I am. It tells me what directory I'm in, and it keeps me relative to the, the path of my whole application, so it's telling me I'm currently in the homeschool core directory. I can hit minus again and go up another directory, and I can hit minus again. And, you know, I can take it all the way up to root if I want. Um, so now I'm at the root of the whole operating system. I, I don't usually do this, but just showing how, how, how quick that can be to as an, as an exp exploration navigation kind of way to go. So those are just three use, useful plug plugins for navigation, um, but plugins can do all sorts of extra stuff. They can do help you with um, style checking or code linting, or um, I have a plugin that helps me with my prose for when I'm writing articles that anytime I write the word easy or um, simple uh, in a markdown file, it'll highlight that word for me and say, did you actually mean to type this? Because some people might interpret this differently. Um, so, you know, there are plugins for all sorts of things out there. And I think they're a useful way to, to add to your repertoire of, of mastery. So the, those three things, mastering motions, using your leader keys, leader key to customize, implement custom commands, and then using plugins are really good ways to go. And with that, that's what I've got to present here today. I'm happy to take some more questions though, if you, if you all have them. Nothing in chat, so it's all audio at this point. That was awesome, Matt. Just another, like, just some quick kudos for being an awesome presenter. That was really, uh, really good. Thank you. Appreciate that. Yes, very nice presentation. I just put a link in the uh, chat. Uh, what do you think of Vim Cubed? Have you taken a look at it? I have not, but happy to, let's, let's do that together. Um, let me see if I can find the chat. <laughs> There you go. Vim cubed. No, not not familiar with this one. Take a scroll down. It's more amusing. Whoa! <laughs> scroll down to the questions. Awesome. Um, yeah. how do I stop cube from spinning? No. <laughs> That's amazing. The um, 
So this reminds me, I, I used to, when I first got into Linux, it was back when everybody was doing Compass customization and doing fiery windows that w will explode when you close them, or you can switch between workspaces by rotating the sides of a cube. So this bring back, brings back memories. I like it. Very nice. Found it the other day. It was amusing. Figured I'd throw it at you. That's awesome. Thank you. Hey, Matt. Um, two questions are kind of related. One is, uh, do you use like the tab view much in them? And the second one is, do you ever do like, uh, how do you manage like um, going back and forth from the terminal in the VIM if you're like running code, executing, testing something, that type of thing? Yeah, good questions. Um, I can't believe I forgot to mention those. Uh, so thank you, Mark. Let's go back to that that file. Because you're, you're absolutely right. There are times where you want to look at more than one file. And I, I do this all the time myself. So Vim has a number of ways to actually manage looking at multiple files. It has an idea of tabs. It also has this idea of splits. And you can use both, but uh, I think they're kind of different mindsets for that people have. Some people like the tab system. Some people like the, the split system. I, I think that the split system is, is super nice. So it's the one I'll show here. So I have a, a file that, that pairs with, with this views file, space file. And so here I have um, the, I kind of structure these in parallel. So you can see that this app view thing goes along with this test case, this Python test case. And if you don't know Python code, I apologize. Just know that, you know, just treat these as two separate text files that you can do. And so by having splits, I can keep context in multiple places. And I don't know if you're noticing it, but I'm jumping between them. There are navigation shortcuts, which I've actually mapped to a couple leaders commands to make them even shorter to jump between splits. And so this was created with a, a vertical split. Um, and my control P plugin gives me commands to bring up, rather than take over a, 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 a file, it can put it in a new split. So if I want to say another file and I want a horizontal split, I can use a command that gives me a horizontal split. And you can get crazy with this. I, I don't recommend, you know, for me personally, as soon as I get to like the two by two, that's about as much as I can manage before I start going insane. But having a couple splits open that you can navigate easily between is, is a very useful pattern, especially if you are in the cycle of here's my production code uh, for something, and then here's my application code that I want to run. And then your second question, I think Mark was about executing commands, or, or maybe if I, I might have misinterpreted it, but I'll, I'll explain my thought here, and then, then um, if, I, if I got it wrong, you can fill me on what I got it wrong. Um, but I have another plugin that is called Vim Test. And the plugin is designed so that whenever I'm doing testing, I can, with a, another keystroke, another leader command, I can execute that. And I'm not in my virtual environment on, so hold on. And on directory, yeah, all sorts of things going on. Back to where I was, you make an actual compelling presentation so it actually looks like it succeeds rather than fails miserably. <clears throat> so this should now pass. And what I did is I ran a leader command and it used my test plugin and it read okay, you want to run the test okay, because your cursor is in here, you wanted to run this particular test. And so I ran that test and brought it right into Vim. I never had to leave Vim. I never had to go over anywhere else, execute another test command. I stayed in Vim. It gets back to that theme of, can you stay in Vim? And the, the more things you can do to do that, the, the faster I think you'll go. Yeah, I, th I think that is kind of the, flavor of what I was asking because because right now I, I end up going in and out of, of them to go run a bash script say or, or whatever it is a, a Python yeah. and you just don't leave you stay inside it sounds like as much as possible as much as I can there are some commands that I, I do keep on the side like um, 
I do have a, a plugin, for example, for dealing with Git, um, but I find that, that the actual management of Git, it's just something that's easier for me to have a secondary directory open that are for the stuff where, yes, Vim is super convenient, and yes, Vim can execute shell commands, but sometimes you just want a shell. <laughs> and so it's okay to have like a thing on the side that, that helps you do that. So, um, you know, if I want to run my it, it status commands and all that kind of stuff, I can keep that in, a, in something else. But I do, you know, for my main flows where I can put them in here, um, that's useful. And if I ever need to execute a couple uh, shell commands, you can do that with, um, you know, with a bang on your EX mode. So I'm like what I've listed here is I'm about to execute the word count command. And uh, well, thought I was. Oh, you know what? I forgot the file name. So it's trying to count everything or something right now. So you, you learn a little bit of syntax and um, learn how to execute commands within the shell. And so there's 779 words in my uh, test views file. So that, that's the kind of stuff that you can do, the little one-off things. Thanks. Sure. Any other questions? All right. Thanks all. I'm going to stop the recording.